What's up, guys? It's yo boy I'm the sensei back with, the boys. Reborn as the Homelander. Part 3. If you enjoy my content, consider subscribing to the channel. Like the video, share, and leave a comment. This really helps with the algorithm. Remember to check out the author of this fantastic fanfic. Link in the description. Also, I have set up a Patreon account, consider joining to support the channel. With all that out of the way, let's get into it. Ah! Enough! No more interference! Soldier Boy recovers just as fast turning towards Starlight, his body resuming his death glow brighter than before. Time slows as she feels the heat radiating off him, stinging her skin, burying itself inside of her. She sees the mutated faces of Butcher and M.M. shouting, but the sound takes its time to reach her ears. Her eyes turn back to her assailant. The small movement takes an eternity, as the red intensifies. Her stomach drops and knees tremble, she is weak, the radiation is making her weak. She sees it happening but can't move. I'm going to die is the single clear thought that resonates as certainty. Annie. The scream hits like a wave. In a blur he's there enveloping the glowing death from behind. His eyes meet hers, and a shiver goes up her spine lightning fast. In another explosive blur they are both gone, time resuming its normal course as the sound of the crashed window and wall reaches all of them. Homelander saved me was the first thought that popped into her mind as she watched the confused looks of everyone around her. He saved all of us. He she didn't have time to finish the thought as a flash of red and broken. The building shook along with crashing sounds of broken glass, steel beams falling and cement scraping. Cherry. Frenchie says as he rushes to Kamiko. His scream brings everyone out of their shock. Dewey. She says loudly mostly to herself while rushing to his side. What the fuck was that? M.M. asks as he rushes to the window. Hopefully that's cunt boy blowing up Homelander. She hears Butcher say as he joins M.M. by the opening in the side of the building. Yay, and half of Manhattan with him. She hears M.M. say with fury. Allying with that madman. Huey. She screamed as she saw he was bleeding from his mouth and having a hard time breathing along with a bruise starting to swell on the side of his head. She tries to help him but is distracted by a desperate call from Frenchie. Guys. She turns and sees Frenchie and Kamiko, the girl already recovered, backing away from a slowly advancing war. Well, the little black dog wants to keep playing. She hears Butchers say while ignoring the furious looks from M.M. An attack dog without a master well that won't do, we'll just have to put you down now won't we? A sputtering cough brings her attention back to her boyfriend. Her resolve steals and she screams. Enough. Everyone's attention is on her. She turns to them with righteous fury. Butcher. Noir. Stand down. Now the lights flicker all around them and her eyes start glowing. Noir stops for a moment to look at her tilts his head to the right, then relaxes his stance and gives her a mock salute. Good dog. Butcher quips which only enrages her. You. You selfish prick. She starts advancing on him. Huey is dying and you want to keep fighting. That seemed to bring Butcher back to reality as a pang of shame colored his features. Huey. He said as he rushed to the replacement little brother. Look at all this destruction. Soldier Boy could have brought the whole building down. Thousands could have died. Butcher looked at her from Huey's side with resigned determination. It wasn't supposed to go down like this, the plan was. Man, your plans are always fucked up. They never work. M.M. said frustrated. But this Butcher. This takes the fucking cake. M.M. said resentfully looking out the city skyline. I see at least half a dozen buildings with damage, debris falling everywhere, how many people died tonight because of you? He said with anger as he turned back towards the group. How much blood until you are satisfied? She could see Butcher was about to respond, so she interfered. Enough. No more fighting. Huey needs help. We need to take him to a hospital. Butcher reluctantly nodded, and so did M.M. Butcher picked up Huey and carried him as they made their exit to the stairs. As she passed the stoically looking war she saw him sign rapidly with his hands and give her a nod once he was done. Confused she turned to Frenchie for translation. The man's face scowled but translated nonetheless. He said the seven need their light. 
Annie couldn't help but feel an anxious knot in her chest. Until this compound runs out in a few hours like you said there isn't much we can do. The internal bleeding has stopped by itself and we tube him to deal with the perforated lung. Starlight listened aptly to the doctor describing Huey's condition to her butcher and Huey's dad Hugh Campbell. As next of kin it was he who could authorize any procedures to be made on Huey, so they had to bring him in. So I'm not too worried about that, it's the brain injury that worries me. He said. Six hours it had taken six hours until the doctors were able to see Huey and perform all the tests needed to assess his situation. The emergency rooms around the city were packed with injuries both minor and major, from the earlier battle between Homelander and Soldier Boy. The swelling from the blunt force trauma is manageable with anti-inflammatory medication, but it's the lesions that I can't do anything about. That brought her back to reality. Lesions? Hugh Campbell asked. Yes, lesions. The scans indicate his brain has suffered damage all over outside of the blunt force trauma he just received, not only that, but there are some small growths of tumors in various places. Has he ever experienced? Starlight, out of the corner of her eye, caught Butcher suddenly stiffening up, falling and shaking. Seizures. The doctor finished loudly as he moved to the falling Butcher. To his credit, the doctor immediately mobilized Hugh and asked him to put his hands underneath Butcher so as not to hurt his head. Not that Butcher could since he was still doped up on 24 volt. The doctor continued yelling in code over the phone as a bunch of nurses flooded into the office. We'll have to continue this conversation later. You can go back to the waiting area or home we will call you if there is any change in Huey's condition. And with that he rushed them out of the room. I'm going to stay. The father said. They might need me. You should go home it looked like you've been through a lot today. Starlight silently agreed and hugged the man. As she made her way out of the hospital she realized there might not be a home to return to. The tower might still be off limits and she has no idea if her apartment was damaged in the fight. Her thoughts were interrupted by the buzzing vibrations of her phone. Ashley was video calling her. Hello. She said with curiosity as a disheveled Ashley appeared on screen. Oh thank god. Starlight. You need to come to the tower. We need your help, they are trying to get him. You need to come back. Annie was taken aback by the rapid fire spewing from Ashley. Ashley wait, slow down. What happened? She asked the flustered woman. The fucking feds happened. That's what? They're here to take Homelander. Noir fought them off. Fuck, we're so fucked. We're all going to jail. Fuck fuck fuck. Annie could see Ashley was starting to lose it again. Ashley slowed down. What do you mean they are trying to take Homelander? Where is he? What happened with him and Soldier Boy? Martin's team picked Homelander up from Harlem a few hours ago. Wait, Martin, Martin Schultz the CSO? She interrupted. Yes, the fucking CSO. Ashley answered exasperatedly. Homelander was hurt really bad, they've been operating on him ever since. That actually shocked her. If they were operating that means he was powerless? The CIA somehow found out and put a team together to take him, with some fucking legal bullshit that our council is trying to fight right now. Wait, what happened to Soldier Boy? I don't know, Martin thinks Homelander threw him into the moon or something. Look that doesn't matter we need you here. I'm only here with 8 Rain who is helping the police with clean up. She continued. Deep is keeping Ryan away that's right, Butcher said that Ryan had been there as well, another fuck up on his part, and Noir is guarding the operating room. She paused. I've sent out a call to the other heroes and some are coming in, but they need a leader. Your captain of the seven, you, A Train and Deep need to show a united front they'll follow you. We need to prevent them from taking Homelander. But if they have the legal right what can we do? Fuck Annie. We physically stop them. Ashley said incensed. We buy time so our legal team can fight this. Look Homelander is Vought. She said exasperated. If they take him it won't just be him, they'll take Meave, and they'll take Ryan, wait, Meave? Why would they take Meave? She interrupts Ashley. Because she's the strongest woman in the world that's why. And she's currently unconscious and helpless. And what do you think will happen if they fuck up and can't contain John? He recovers and finds out they took his son again? She stopped and paused as she saw Starlight grimace. Look Annie, this is a mistake waiting to happen. We can stop this. 
I need you to at least keep the rest in line, so this doesn't escalate more than it needs to. We just need to buy some time that's it. Please. Annie sighed and felt the knot of anxiousness grow larger and tighter in her chest. Homelander was hurt, technically an opportunity to end this, but it wasn't guaranteed, and Noir was guarding him. The government would try again and with more heroes inbound it would surely escalate, more people would die. And if they took Meave, Ryan and Homelander recovered, then even more people would die. She couldn't help but feel a string of despair resonate within her. Death, everywhere there was death. They were supposed to be heroes, to help people to prevent death, not cause it. How did things go sideways so fast she couldn't help but think. The seven need their light noir's last words to her came knocking at the front of her mind. No, she was a hero, she wouldn't sacrifice more people just on a chance that Homelander could be taken down. I'm not like Butcher she thought, and with a sad thought continued her like Yui. With steely eyes she looked at Ashley's image and responded. I'm on my way. The small vibration indicating that Ashley pressed the end call button on the screen was accompanied by the closing image of starlight fading to black. Okay, good, good, starlight is coming over, she whispered more to herself than anyone else not that there was anyone else in her office. This can be salvaged, just need time for counsel too she didn't get to finish as her office door opened and her assistant walked in. What do you have for me? She asked expectantly of her mini self. Minnie Ashley's face scrunched with hesitation as if she had just taken a sour patch bear. Not good, no one's answering. The contacts at Dodd are silent, and the few lower rung aides that answered all said they had no idea about it, but can't reach the senators now. Ashley felt anxiety building in her chest again, along with a fire of rage. Arg. She let out a frustrated yell while her hands made to choke a non-existing person making her mini self shrink back in fear. Those fucking assholes. They smell blood and don't want to be caught on the wrong side of this. Fuck. She yelled. This is why you can't rust politicians. They will take bots money, but when it comes to a little information, she just shook her head in denial, fucking assholes. Congresswoman Newman answered she said FBS didn't know about the raid either, but she's looking into it. Her assistant tried to reassure her. Of course she didn't. Ashley's hands went to cover her face. Of course, she fucking didn't. She took a few deep breaths to calm herself down. Just figure it out he says you're the CEO she mumbled to herself, remembering the conversation she had with Martin when she pulled him out of the OR to warn him about the incoming agents. I shouldn't have done that she thought as she started to bite her nails. No, it wouldn't have mattered her consciousness changing course noir was going to be there anyway. She'd just reached the top and now it was all close to crashing down around her. Worse it might drag her down as well and end up in prison. Martin outright said if he goes down he's bringing everyone else with him, and then Noir had to go and be a one-man fucking army. And now no one is picking up the phone. Fuck. She thought and bit harder on the nail in her right thumb. What would Stan do? Fuck. This never would have happened under Edgar. Fuck. Okay calm yourself, what would he do? She thought rapidly. Okay she thought and took a deep breath he would play to his strengths. He would use his political connections and favors to squash this but I can't do that because I don't have his contacts and no one is fucking answering me. Her inner frustration realizing only as shaky closed fists on the outside. What are my strengths? I don't have the same connections as him. She shook her head. Because I spend every fucking waking second crisis managing selfish, egoistic, self-absorbed and incredibly stupid super-powered celebrities. Idiots who wouldn't be able to string two sentences Tog she suddenly stopped, her eyes widening in realization. Ashley are you okay? She heard her assistant ask. Do you want me to get you anything? Maybe a band-aid? She asked reluctantly. Your thumb is bleeding. Her eyes looked down at her hand and saw the tiny red droplet going down her knuckle from the outside side of her nail. She had ripped off a bit too much skin trying to chew on the dead end. Her instant reaction was to bring it back to her lips and suck the remaining drip out. She held it there for a second taking the time to formulate her thoughts. We're going live. She said as she removed the appendage from her mouth. What? The mini her asked. The CIA wants to pull this shady shit in the middle of the night? Let's see how America feels about this. She paused. We promised more transparency right? So let's shed some light on what just happened. 
She said with conviction. So live on TV? Minnie Ashley asked. The studio's a mess I don't think the crew can fuck TV. Ashley said. Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, TikTok. She paused, we'll go live on all of them at the same time. And finished with a smile. She wasn't Stan, but she had her own strengths. Date. October 2022 as the warm sun rays of the cold fall morning fell gently on him, his eyes surveyed the bright but small clearing for any movements in the trees. His body only slightly tense in preparation to move at an instant's notice, not because of any so-called perceived danger instead due to wanting to fulfill his task, and though he wouldn't really admit it also because of the small thrill he was feeling. As usual it was his ears that first picked up the telltale sign of the incoming target, though to be technical he was the target, and the other one was the pursuer. It only took a split moment for his pursuer to enter the clearing, in what would be considered a way too fast blur for anyone else to follow, yet posing no strain on his eyes. He waited until the last possible moment to move, when his opponent felt the most confident lunging hands forward towards his waist, to grab the blue-colored flag tightly secured to his belt. In a smooth motion he simply twirled out of the way letting his now white-eyed assailant fly by him, while at the same time removing the unprotected red-colored flag from his waist. The surprise move must have briefly startled his opponent, for he lost form and fell unceremoniously, causing his body to bounce off the ground multiple times as he struggled to stop his speedy momentum. Too slow. He said with a big smile, happily waving the red flag as the dirt and grass covered boy stopped finally in a forceful hover. Damn it. The sullen boy said. I thought I had you this time. You were standing still. He finished as he floated towards him. I was anticipating. It was a trap. I knew you wouldn't be able to resist trying to catch me off guard. All I'd have to do is wait for you to make your move and simply move out of the way. He said with a smile as the blue and black spandex wearing boy landed in front of him. I used your eagerness and momentum to defeat you. Moving fast is more than just hurling yourself at the greatest speed possible. You have to anticipate, you have to think 10 moves ahead otherwise you crash. Ugh, but it's so hard, especially when we run through the forest. There are too many trees and branches in the way. He responded frustrated. And in the city there will be moving people and cars which are more unpredictable than standing trees. I could just fly, it's easier when I fly the skies are clear. I can go as fast I can. The boy responded. That may be so but the people that you will need to help are mostly going to be on the ground. You don't want to accidentally crash into them do you? Accidentally hurt them? He asked the young boy. No. I don't. He said somewhat resigned yet serious at the same time. It's just you make it seem so easy. I'll never catch up to you. The older man chuckled good-naturedly at his words. You know, Ryan, at your age I crashed into everything around me as well. Then how did you get so good? Ryan asked. Practice of course. Practice, practice, practice and I had a good coach. He said his tone more solemn now. My brother, he made me practice every day after school. You sound like my dad now. Every day we have to train. His tone annoyed. Well how do you think he became the world's greatest hero? A-Train asked rhetorically, ironically the last month was the most he'd ever seen Homelander train in any way shape or form, since he'd been in the 7, but he wasn't about to tell that to the kid. Now come on it's almost lunchtime, let's get you home, running no flying. Ryan sighed, fine. Dad. We're home. Ryan yelled as they stopped in front of the giant-sized open garage of the equally large mansion where the father and son duo now resided. Ironically the estate was only a few miles away from where the Harrogasm house was in Vermont. Why Homelander chose this place a train didn't know, sure it was a decent plot of land and it offered privacy, but in his opinion, there were better places in New York and around the country than cloudy Vermont. No need to yell Ryan. I could hear you from miles away. Homelander responded. A-Train could see the leader of the seven in the garage where he was pulling with his right hand on a cable attached to a large and complicated machine, filled with gears, weights and motors, providing resistance to his slow and methodical movements. How much are you pulling now dad? Ryan asked enthusiastically. 50 tons. Homelander responded not turning around to face them his focus solely on the machine. Wow. The boy was amazed. That's so heavy. 
Is that why you're going so slowly? He asked as we slowly walked up to him. Homelander was in a white t-shirt and dark training slacks. A train could see the lightly pink colored scarred and crinkly skin running down the side of his neck through his right arm. His hair was shaved on the sides, and while he'd let the top grow longer the dark strap of the eye patch was clearly evident. It's not too heavy. He responded. But I'm going slowly because I want to train my fine movement control under pressure. I could simply yank it like this. He said and suddenly jerked his right hand backwards past his body, making the machine's motors whirl with a loud whizzing noise as they tried and failed to resist the motion. But that wouldn't be help with what I needed. It's not always about strength, I need control as well, and for that I need to practice. A-Train could feel Ryan roll his eyes. He couldn't help but think he was going to be a handful once he's fully in his teen years. Plus I don't to break the machine. Homelander finished as they all felt a distinct burning smell caused by metal rubbing on metal. He gently released the cable back to its slack position and turned to them. Now then how did training go? Ryan slumped. I lost again. It was 4 to 1. He got me once. He's improving, only crashed 4 times. I would have caught you more if I could fly. It's not fair. Ryan said sullenly. We talked about this. Flying with me only running when with a train. But it's not fair. He's so fast and when I try to catch up I end up flying, but then I try not to, and I end up crashing. A train watched as Homelander put a hand on Ryan's shoulder, striking the most perfect fatherly figure he'd ever seen, the scars and eye patch, only adding to the image of the wizened father imparting wisdom to the eager son. He had been surprised when Homelander approached him to train Ryan, then again being surprised by Homelander seemed to be the norm now. Flying is like a fifth limb you have. It's a brand new limb that you barely know how to use, and when moving fast, you are trying to coordinate not four limbs but five. You're not used to it so you trip up. You just have to practice more. He heard the man say. Sometime in between having his attention taken by Blue Hawk and dealing with his family, something had changed with Homelander. In some ways he was like a completely different person, and in others he was more Homelander than ever. The man had become a workaholic he'd taken a deep interest in all things Vought, more than that he was pushing for the retraining for all the heroes for better PR as he called it, but also for better control of them. He'd been assigned to work on that project with Starlight, which honestly suited him just fine. Starlight had a keen mind, was easy to work with, and agreed with him on improving relations with the black community. He didn't mind her taking the lead it was a win-win for both of them. That wasn't all he felt more than conflicted and confused when he heard that it had been Homelander's idea to give him Blue Hawk's heart. He was still technically in recovery, but apparently the heart and his body had adapted to each other, unlike the scientist had ever seen, though apparently this was the first of this kind of operation that was performed on supers. Now then, let me take a look at you, make sure there's nothing broken or internal bruising. He heard Homelander say as he saw the man concentrate at looking at Ryan with his one good eye. How he dealt with Soldier Boy was also out of character, but he could see the PR moves he made. His and Starlight's ratings were through the roof. Savior of New York they called him. Inwardly A-Train scowled. Something about the whole situation stunk, but he couldn't put his finger on it. Still, through the chaos he'd thought about taking a shot at Homelander and helping the government when he heard Ashley's broadcast but decided not to. Minor bruises only that are already healing up. I don't see any problems. Homelander stated as he finished checking Ryan over. Come on, let's go inside. You need to shower and I'll set up lunch. He said and paused. A train you're staying for lunch. There are a few things I want to talk to you about. He ordered more than requested. Sure. He answered as Homelander led them all inside. The thought had crossed his mind when he heard Ashley's broadcast, but he quickly realized the futility. Even if he took out Noir, what would happen then? The public already knew the government had made a move on Homelander in his weakened state, they would never forgive him for helping them, not to mention the other heroes that supported Homelander. That and there was the surprising fact that Starlight was on the way to help Bot. From the time he spent with her he could tell the girl had changed as well. There was something bothering her. Still if that hadn't been a shock, then the conversation with Homelander he had when he was asked to train Ryan had been a game changer. 
He of course didn't fully trust Homelander, but if there was a shot to heal his brother he would take it. Homelander told him Vought's brightest were working on some game-changing serums, stuff that would revolutionize the world. He didn't care for the details, and the rant Homelander went on about changing humanity, as long as he could heal his brother he would do anything. He needed to do this for his family, for his niece and nephew and for himself. All that Homelander had asked was for loyalty and to toe the line. That had been strange in itself. There were no physical threats or overtures about being kicked out of the Seven. The man instead had offered his support on bringing the A-Train brand back greater than ever before, and all he had asked was to essentially keep his mouth shut and do as he was told. It wasn't like he had much of a choice, so he readily accepted and pledged his support. Part of him felt sick, like he'd just swore fealty to a new king, but what could he do in his position? So Homelander started as he took out large Tupperware boxes filled with pasta and chicken from the fridge. There are a couple of projects I need your help with BZZT BZZT. Homelander was interrupted by the cell phone vibrating on the massive kitchen counter. One second. I have to take this. He said gesturing to him as he picked up the phone. Hey Ashley dot what? Slow down? Now? Why? What is she doing dot 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 we'll calm her down. 8 Rain heard rapid voice talking on the phone but couldn't make out who it was. Okay, just do what you can. I'm with 8 Rain we'll be there in a few minutes. The man said and hung up. Change of plans. We have to go to the tower starlights threatening the scientists or something like that. What? That shocked him. Starlight? Are you sure? He was taken aback by the news. Yay, that was Ashley. I think I know what this is about. I'll explain once we get there. He finished and waked towards the staircase stopping right in front of it. Ryan. He shouted loudly. Something came up. Me and a train have to go to the tower. Okay. He heard boy's response from upstairs. Lunch is on the counter just microwave it, and I repeat do not use your heat vision. I don't want to come back to a burned down house. Got it? There was no response for a moment. Ryan. Do you hear me? Homelander asked again more sternly. Yes I got it. Good and make sure to review those Khan Academy videos I told you. I'm showering. The annoyed response of the boy came back accompanied by a door slamming closed. Homelander rolled his eyes. The adjustment has been, and he paused. Well we are still adjusting. He trailed off with a small but somewhat frustrated smile. Let's get to the tower before Starlight takes it down. He said with a sigh. Having reached the tower, a train made his way up to the labs as quick as he could, without destroying the stairs and doors. In the hallway he could see a small crowd of people gathered outside the hallway doors murmuring to themselves, some of the scientists in lab attire, Ashley and her assistant, Rhonda the head of HR, Shauna the head of legal and Martin the CSO, along with a few goons from the security force. Ashley what's going on? He asked getting their attention. Oh a train you're here. She turned around surprised. A homelander's handling the situation. Just as she finished the lights flickered accompanied by a blinding flash of light and loud bang. Enough. They all heard Homelander shout from inside. Homelander had beaten him by maybe one or two minutes to the tower. Eight rain pushed past all of them and went inside to see what was happening. Damn it Annie. Are you trying to bring the whole fucking tower down? He saw Homelander holding Starlight's hands up restraining her by the wrists, with the woman struggling to break free. Let me go. She shouted. It's all your fault. You killed Alex and now Huey is dying because of you. It's you it's always you. With a burst of energy she tried pulling her hands free once more, but it was a futile attempt Homelander's grip didn't falter one bit. Let me go. She screamed once more. No. Came his equally loud reply. A train saw she was about to speak, but Homelander continued in his aggressive tone. What did I say that night? He asked firmly. I told you if Huey keeps playing Butcher's game he would get himself killed. I told you Butcher will get him killed. He doesn't care about anyone one of you he's just using you to get to me. He paused for a moment as a reluctant starlight absorbed his words. They stole 24 volt, and they chose to use it freely without knowing the consequences. No one at Vought made them do that. Homelander continued. Why do you think neither I nor Edgar released 24 volt for use? He asked. The compound wasn't ready. 
He state flatly. That seemed to deflate the young heroine but not fully. V made him like this then V can fix him. Give me a dose it's all I'm asking. She stated softer. A train now understood the situation. Starlight came to get a shot of compound V hoping to save Huey. Problem was all V samples were now under lock and key somewhere in the building known only to a few of the scientists, execs and security team. No unauthorized personnel were allowed to touch the stuff under threat of retribution from the big guy himself. Another change in Homelander when compared to over a year ago when he stole a bunch of old samples and made him spread it around the globe. No. A-Train immediately saw Starlight's face scrunch up. You bastard. You want him dead. You knew and you said nothing. You I couldn't care less about Huey. Homelander interrupted her. Dead or alive he means nothing to me. He never posed a threat to me it wasn't him I was ever worried about. Then let me save him. She said exasperated and struggled against his might grip once more. Eight Rain saw Homelander look at her pondering her requests. How bad is he? The question threw her off and she stopped struggling. He fell in a coma. The doctors said it could be a week or it could be a month they don't know. He saw Homelander's shoulders slump and the man let out a small sigh. I can see why you're so desperate. He finally said. I'm going to let you go if you promise you won't attack anymore. Starlight nodded and he released his grip. A train can you bring Dr. Schultz back in here? The speedster was almost startled as he was addressed for the first time since intruding on this private, yet not so private argument. No need. I'm here. The man said from behind him who in fact did actually startle him this time, luckily his reaction was all internal. Well, can V save Huey? Homelander asked the old scientist. No. He answered flatly. How can you know? You haven't tried. Starlight exclaimed. No, but I have spent my whole life studying V. The old man said firmly. I know how the compound works. From what you described your friend's situation is terminal already, and as I was trying to explain to you earlier giving him V now would likely kill him outright, his body won't be able to handle the stress, and that's assuming he is compatible. He paused. V and 24 volt are related but not quite the same. They are not exactly interchangeable. The CSO said. I'm sorry but as Homelander said there is a reason why it's in the testing stage still, even small amounts have proven to be deadly, much more so than V. But there has to be something you can do. I know you're working on some new compounds. She insisted. Sure, maybe in a year or three or five or maybe tomorrow. Martin said with a tinge of sarcasm. Our research is progressing in several avenues that could potentially help your friend and millions of others, but scientific progress is slow. He paused. There is a component of luck in everything we do. It could be tomorrow it could be 10 years from now. I'm truly sorry but there is nothing we can do for your friend right now. A train saw starlight deflate completely as hope vanished from her eyes and sadness crept in. To his surprise he saw Homelander gently put his arms on her shoulder. Annie, I'm sorry. I understand he means a lot to you and you want to help him, but there is nothing we can do. The only thing you can do is to go and be there for him in his final moments. He said and paused. Come on. I'll take you home for now. He continued and gently nudged the now cooperative heroine into moving by putting his arm around her. As the two captains silently moved past him and Martin, a train couldn't help but notice as Starlight seemed to sink deeper into Homelander's embrace. Date. October 2022 Even with the increased debt ratios the projected cash flows are more than enough to cover both interest servicing and the increased OPEX. As I sat in the conference room surrounded by the exec team, I couldn't help but feel excited watching Ashley answer question after question with machine-like precision. Dressed in a light blue power suit jacket and pencil skirt, along with matching bra and panties, yes I peeked Sumi, plump red lips moving without hesitation, I couldn't help but think she looked like a preppy terminator, but instead of killing she was spitting finance answers. Truthfully I was getting a stiffy. After years of pressure working for Vaught and handling Homelander, there was nothing these finance cucks could throw that would phase her. Ha! Eat your heart out Edgar. Ashley was a diamond in the making. She was sitting at the head of the table, strategically placed to show that she was in charge of Vaught, while I was in my full suit at the middle of the table. Chairman of the board or not the street had only known me a Homelander the hero, 
the savior of New York, leader of the seven. Officially I had no business experience, and even though I had much more patience to answer their questions than the old homelander, it was best that answers came from someone who was at least qualified in their eyes. Even so the earnings call was going just okay. Both our revenues and profits had dipped for the quarter, which was no surprise to anyone considering the shit show Vaud had gone through in the last few months. Of course it wasn't our quarterly results that caused the uproar it was the forecast along with all the new initiatives that broke all hell loose. Realistically projected earnings for 2022 were going to be okay, lower than expected, but overall okay. It took time for initiatives to ramp up especially in a big corporation like Vought. Next year was where most of the spending would ramp up, along with the partnership with Byron Satcom for VLite, the new satellite telecom venture. Yay, people freaked out about that, and the grilling intensified. Not only that but then they realized how much we were planning on borrowing, and saw how much the debt ratios went up they had a stroke again. It was a bit unorthodox the way we were presenting this. Usually we'd announce new ventures or initiatives come budget time, using press conferences once it was all planned. Crossing the I's and dotting the T's, that sort of thing. This time I instead went for a massive push on the whole management team for the past two months to get a semblance of plan out as early as possible. I wanted the street to get used to the new management initiatives, along with the venture into telecom and space as early as possible. Take the stock slump this year as a shock and ironically let it ride back up in the next year, while the actual spending spree is on the way. In a way I was doing this for this for the stockholders, minimizing the risks and protecting their interests. Of course the most specific stockholder I was worried about was me. A lot of Homelander's wealth was tied up in bought stock. Between the various royalties and stock portfolios his and now my net worth was around $400 million. Now Homelander never really put any care into his finances, and why should he? Everything he ever needed or wanted was provided by Vought. Unlike him, I cared about it quite a bit, and just like Vought, I was planning on borrowing a metric ton against my stock and options, not only to diversify, but also to invest in VLite and the soon-to-be-acknowledged space ventures. I understood very well the power and influence money gave you, especially when you had a large purse to spend on whatever you wanted. I didn't just plan on being the most powerful person physically or figuratively by being at the head of Vought, I was going for personal power in all aspects of my life. There was also the factor that I was riding high on the savior of New York bit, which gave a lot of public leeway. That made it unlikely that some of our biggest shareholders like the New York State and Local Retirement System, NYLRS, who administers both the Employees Retirement System, ERS, funds and the Police and Fire Retirement System, PFRS, funds, would move to remove me from the board for all the changes I was bringing in. For now New York loved me, and I needed to take advantage of that. With Byron providing their satellite technology and Vought administrative and launch capabilities Ashley confidently droned answers on and on. First the earnings called then the ensuing media circus probably for another two months, hopefully it will calm down by the new year. Was all I could think as the meeting continued past the scheduled hour. Date. December 2022 Meve walked into the surprisingly clean apartment with trepidation and a bit of dread. So what brings your royal highness to visit little old me? Butcher's gruff voice asked and Meeve couldn't help but scowl. Didn't happen to finally get your hands on some V did you? No security is still tighter than a drum. You look like shit, not eating again? She eyes his dark circles under his eyes and thinning frame. Christ he probably lost another stone. She thought. Billy scowled in return and went to the kitchen and pulled out a whiskey bottle from one of the top cabinets and two glasses. The bloody pills keep the seizures away but cut the hunger right out, makes everything taste like stale cardboard. He said and took a sip of the caramel liquid. Not whiskey I see. She remarked. No, not whiskey. He gave her a cocky smirk, whether it's the V, the pills or the booze one way or another I'm slowly wasting away, might as well make it all three. He said and handed her the second glass. She took it, put it to her lips and took a small sip. They both stood in silence for a brief moment enjoying the sensation of the drink. Have you visited Huey? His demeanor darkened instantly. Bit hard to do with the monitor. He said and tapped his ankle. Like that could stop you. She couldn't help but sarcastically remark. Well, wouldn't want to make Mallory look bad. 
She went to bat for me on this one. He took another strong swing of his glass turning away back to the kitchen counter. She felt a surge of annoyance at him. You should go. Doctors said it's a miracle he even regained consciousness, they say it could be any day now. Annie's there every day, even MM showed, yes I fucking know. He said slamming his glass down on the counter shattering it. Meave watched as Butcher suddenly stopped and took a deep breath. I know. I know. Okay. I will. He said with finality. Now you're not really here to nag me about my absence from visiting hours, I got enough of that from Frenchie and Kamiko, nor do I see a magic you're all vial in your hands, so why are you here? He asked as he started to clean up the broken glass and spilled contents. The sense of anxiety overtook her again. This was the moment she had dreaded for the last week, but he needed to know. She took a quick breath and steadied herself. No, you're right. I'm here to tell you that I'm pregnant. He stopped and paused for a moment, then turned to her from the kitchen counter. Well, congratulations. He said. Seems to be that this is the season. He remarked and she couldn't help but give him a questioning look. Kamiko broke the news two weeks ago. Haven't seen Frenchie happier he paused or more scared than ever. He went and threw the shards in his hand in the trash. But I am quite curious he said turning back to her how'd that happen? Now Meave felt annoyed and put her hands on her hips in her signature pose. Do I have to explain the birds and the bees to you? Do you want the Disney version or Animal Planet? She let her sarcasm show. Cheeky. He responded back. But you and Elena well two flowers don't work that way, usually you need a stinger in between. Obviously. She remarked. Now who's the lucky fellow? She paused, raised her brows and slightly inclined her head as if you point at him. Meave saw the exact moment as realization came into his eyes. I'm the stinger? He said more as a statement than a question. By process of elimination, I hadn't slept with anyone in months before and no one after. She affirmed. Fuck. Was his only response. He tried to hide it, but she could see conflicting emotions struggling for dominance in his eyes. She saw that she didn't know what to say so she continued. William she said bringing his attention back. I'm going to keep it. I hadn't thought I was going to be a mother in a long time, but now that it's happened. She paused. She wasn't sure how to express the feelings she's felt ever since realizing she was pregnant, nor could she properly explain the process of how she came to the decisions. Well I just feel like it's the right way to go. She paused again. I'm telling you because it's the right thing, because you should know, because well, because I might kick the bucket any day as well. Because it's unlikely I'll see the birth of my own child. He said and stopped. They both stared at each other in silence for a moment. Right fucking mess this is. He finally said. Does Homelander know? Me felt a surge anger and annoyance permeate her being again. Homelander, Homelander, it always came down to Homelander with Butcher. She was annoyed at Butcher for bringing him into this, and she was annoyed at him for being right to ask the question. How will Homelander react to her carrying Butcher's child? That is if he ever found out it was his. She couldn't get a red him anymore there were too many changes that happened in both him and Vought, but she didn't feel that Homelander will take any action against her. I don't know. I haven't told him so I don't think good. He said firmly. You don't know what that crazy cunt might do. He might hurt you both out of spite. He might. She acknowledged. But I don't think so, something's changed in him, spending time with Ryan changed him, I think. She said hesitantly, she knew there were unresolved issues between Butcher and Ryan, so she quickly continued, besides Vought wouldn't waste the marketing opportunity. Butcher scoffed. They'll parade you around like a prized mare, the pregnant icon, superhero mommy, Christ I can see the billboards now. He said. Probably. She said her tone resigned. I won't be able to acknowledge that it's yours. The PR would be a disaster. He was silent for a split second. Probably for the best. I'll be surprised if Vought doesn't imply immaculate conception to begin with. She smiled. I'm sure someone in marketing will at least suggest it. Do you know what it is? He asked cautiously. She shook her head. No not yet. Maybe in a week or so once I do the tests. He nodded, eyes understanding silently looking at her. A moment, then two, then three passed as they stared at each other until he finally broke. Now what? He asked. She took a moment more, unsure of where to go. I guess, now you know. 
She said her shoulders feeling lighter. Nothing else really. Date. January 2023 The wind moved with strengthening speed from the north, bringing a crisp cold chill to anyone foolish enough to be in its path. The wind was a preview of the snowstorm that was supposed to hit the east coast in the next two days. The storm was going to be a giant mess of icy rain and snow that the networks have been raving for the last few days, striking much-needed fear and caution into regular folks, urging them to stay inside and be safe. Even with the best efforts of state and local officials, it was inevitable that a whole lot of people would be in danger either caught outside in the storm or even in their own homes. All incidents were of course excellent PR opportunities. Truthfully that's what winter was a giant PR opportunity for Vought. There was no better opportunity for our heroes to go out there and make themselves useful than a big natural disaster. The wind picked up again catching my cape and pushing sidewise on me strongly that I had to steady myself in the air. It didn't help that I was about 2 miles high up where the intensity was much higher than the ground. As I steadied myself in position I didn't take my eyes off the group I was watching on the ground foolish enough to be outside. Was I surveying a group of thieves? Murders? Criminal masterminds? Supervillains? No of course not. I was watching a motley crew of soups, heroes and regular humans all dressed in black, gathered around a hole in the ground, saying their last goodbyes to Huey Campbell. And yes the petty part of Homelander that was still a part of me enjoyed every moment of it. Truthfully I did was well. Huey had clanged on to life longer than I expected. Hell for a moment I even thought he was going to recover when I heard he regained consciousness. That wouldn't have been good for me. With Huey alive even if comatose there was no way I could make a move on Starlight, her thoughts would always wander to him. There was just too much bad history and association between the two of us. But with him finally kicking the can and with my hands metaphorically clean of the whole ordeal, after all I'm not the one that gave him V24, hell I even warned her about it, the coast was clear. Meve was there as well. I know that by now she knows she is pregnant. She hasn't told the team yet, but she will. She won't have a choice she's going to start showing soon. Victoria was there, as Huey's boss at FBSA, along with some colleagues, some other regular folks that I assumed were friends and family of his or his father, all looking sad and cold. And of course the boys were there as well braving the weather to acknowledge their own fuck-ups. As I saw and heard his father finish his last remarks and cry into some unknown woman's shoulder, I couldn't help but feel a surging sensation of satisfaction. The heart of the boys was dead. Now all I needed was for that ragged-looking butcher to also die. Date. February 2023 The ding of the elevator signifying the end of the ascent to the top of the tower brought Starlight's attention out of the report and back to reality. As she entered the cavernous space that once was Homelander's apartment, she could see the signs of construction everywhere. Renovation not construction she thought. The actual building construction was done. Homelander had pushed for the building to be repaired as fast as possible, insisting that Vought Tower was a tall, strong and proud shining beacon of power and strength, a symbol of the corporation, the Seven in New York. He sees it as his dick Meave had remarked, and she snorted at the thought. Ashley had of course obliged and spared no expense in getting the work crews and pushing through the red tape. Even so work had gone slow. Vought Tower had been just one of the many buildings that faced damage in the fight for New York, as some like to call it. If only they knew the truth. She briefly thought. After it was all and done there were 136 casualties and over 300 people injured, all from collapsing floors and falling debris. She'd been furious at Huey and Butcher once the reports came out it may not have been them directly who killed them, but they were the one that brought that loose cannon soldier boy into play, so she couldn't help but blame them as well. How Butcher managed to weasel his way out of landing in jail was beyond her, but she suspected the not-so-invisible hand of the CIA at play there. As for Huey, well part of her had been glad that Homelander hadn't exposed him, and part of her was furious with him, and part of her had been really concerned for him. Once he had recovered enough she spoke her mind on the whole matter, and they fought, apologized and fought again. Admittedly she said some things she regretted and he said some things he regretted. The problem was that he hadn't truly recovered before she knew it he fell into a coma, and all her feelings for him bubbled up to the surface again. The doctors kept telling them it could happen any moment, but Huey defied everyone's expectations and clung on to life. 
When he waded back into consciousness she was relieved, even ecstatic, but when she came to see him, when she saw the look in his eyes she it was the end. The time to say goodbye. Ever since then she buried herself into work. There was always work and more work to be done, in between patrols, winter disasters, photo shoots, guest appearances, talk shows, and working on the new retraining program with A-Train, there was always something to be done. Hell she'd been practically left in charge of the Seven, since Homelander was so busy as chairman in the new space venture. More like the Six now she remarked, they still needed to recruit a replacement for Translucent. That's why she was here now, needing to talk with Homelander. She wanted to offer the spot to Silver Kinkade without having to go through the stupid reality TV contest again. As she looked around the cavernous space she couldn't see him. What he was doing up here this late she didn't know. Homelander? She asked raising her voice. Homelander? She asked again walking through the scaffolding set up in various spots. John? Where are you? She asked louder. Up here. Third floor. He finally answered. She went up the stairs and found him concentrated staring out the sliding door into the terrace. Hey, what are you she didn't finish as his right hand went up with his index finger, as if to silence her. I need a few moments. He said. She stared at his back, his hair while shaved on the sides was getting longer on top, and slicked back was falling into wispy ends. Even with the suit being modified to hide more of his neck, you could still see the scarred tissue. She watched as his head turned to the right side and stayed there for a split moment, the scars on the side of his head clearly visible, thought the big eye patch was doing well in covering most of the scaring on the front. He only stayed there for a split moment, then turned to her. Thinking this was her cue she made to speak, but his hand shot up again to prevent her. As she watched him stare directly at her feeling self-conscious under his intense one-eyed gaze, she realized he wasn't staring at her but through her. Just as fast the moment came and went and he turned and focused his gaze back to his left. Okay got it. He said and turned back to her. Put that tablet down. I need your help. Got what? What's going on? She asked curiosity now burning inside of her. Pakistani grooming gang I've been keeping an eye on. 80 miles from here in Jersey, Motel 5, they're about to sell a 16-year-old. What? How? She asked confused. You can see that far? She saw him roll his eyes well I. Yes, I can. It's harder with one eye, need to concentrate, but yes. Now come one we don't have much time. He said extending his hand towards her. Right. She wasn't in costume, but she wasn't going to let that stop her from helping someone. She put the tablet down and took his hand as they talked onto the terrace. Oh fuck it's cold. She couldn't help but exclaim. Channel your power, build the energy in your stomach, then imagine circulating it around your body, build it up, but don't release it. He said firmly. She did and she felt the sting of the cold winter air abate. Now come on. He urged for her to step on his feet. Stiffen up and hold on tightly to me. He said as he wrapped his right hand around her squishing her further into him. Close your eyes or channel energy into them to protect them. We're going to go pretty fast. Ah. She yelped as she barely had time to act on his instructions. He wasn't kidding they were accelerating at an incredible pace, she felt her clothes pushing onto her bunching up against the air drag. She brought up more energy as to protect herself from the biting cold wind. She noticed Homelander was flying upside down supporting her weight with the length of his body for better leverage. Like a rocket they blasted through the sky at ever increasing speeds they were flying low enough that the landscape became a continuous blur. She felt herself being pushed further down into his raised feet raised acting as a wall for her to push against. She felt his grip tighten on her and she did the same. She couldn't tell how long the acceleration took, a minute or two or maybe three, as she suddenly felt they were slowing down. Homelander suddenly twirled and they were right side up. She could see the approaching parking lot of a Motel 5. You take room 15, it's where the girl is. He commanded her firmly as they landed. I'll take seven and have a word with her would be pimps. He finished as he broke off their embrace. Right. She affirmed as her mind went into hero mode. Wait. John wait. He turned back to her. Don't his intense questioning gaze made her hesitate. Don't, don't kill them. They need to face justice, real justice. His gaze lingered on her for a brief second, then snorted as if to hold back a laugh and turned around, cape flapping behind him. 
Well it's the best I can get now. With her mind firm, she set out to complete her task. She banged loudly on the door and yelled open up. A brief look at Homelander she saw he hadn't even bothered with any pleasantries and simply smashed his door. Hey Matterchot I paid for an hour. She heard the man yell from inside. Taking that as all the confirmation she needed she smashed through the door as well. The sight that greeted her infuriated her. A slightly overweight brown girl with long hair, a nose earring and poorly done makeup, was backing up to the corner of the room doing her best to hide her nakedness, while a skinny tall hairy brown man in his underwear was scrambling off the bed. What the bloody fuck who are you? He started shouting, his English heavily accented. You can't come here. I paid the money. He continued slipping into his mother tongue. Starlight could only assume they were not nice things. Shut up. She barked at him. You're under arrest you have the right she didn't get to finish as the weasel looking man now enraged, grabbed his jeans and shoes and rushed her. Fuck you bloody fuck. Maybe because she wasn't in costume he thought he could overpower her because of her smaller frame, or maybe it was the panic and adrenaline, but he came straight at her. Whether he was trying to escape or to fight her it didn't matter, it was a stupid move on his part. She was stronger and faster than him by a very wide margin. As he approached she simply slapped him hard enough that he fell down like a sack of potatoes fully unconscious. She hoped she hadn't caused any permanent damage. The girl immediately yelled. Wait, I'm not going to hurt you. I'm Starlight. She said and glowed her eyes. I'm not here to hurt you. I'm here to help. She said and gave the frightened girl a bed sheet to cover herself up. It's going to be alright. I promise you. It's going to be alright. The girl only nodded and cowered as she wrapped the sheet around her. Starlight ripped a power cord from the lamp and secured the now stirring man. I see you're done your part. Homelander. Both her and the girl exclaimed at the same time. Right. He said and nodded to the girl. All is going to be fine. Police are on the way. We are going to get you help. He said to the frightened girl as he went and picked up her clothing put it in bundle and handed it to her. Annie couldn't help but ask. And the other people are they secure? He said. No issues. Now police will be here in a few minutes. Why don't you stay here with, and here he paused and looked at the girl a, sorry what's your name darling? The girl only looked at him for a moment then slowly said. Anaya, sir. Thank you. He said and turned back to Annie. You stay here with Anaya and make sure she is comfortable while I go deal with everything else. Starlight looked at him briefly then at the scarred girl and agreed. It didn't take long for the police and ambulances to come. They both gave their statements with her focusing on the state of the girl for both police and EMT workers, while Homelander detailed how he'd been tracking the gang. She was surprised when the two would be pimps both in their early 20s, confessed to everything and more on the spot to the police officers. Whatever Homelander had done or said to them before the authorities arrived had been very effective. They both watched in silence as the police finished and left as well. Do you think they will follow up on the rest of the gang? She asked. They will. Now that we've gotten involved. He said neutrally. For a while at least. She looked at him to continue. This motel. He gestured to the building. The owners are part of the gang. They own a few properties around the state. Human trafficking, drug distribution and a plethora of other things are facilitated through them. Then why didn't you mention it, no evidence? He interrupted her. But I know they are part of it. Here we caught these guys in the act. With plenty of evidence. These are dumb young ones, low on the totem pole, they panicked and even confessed. He said with a sly smile. The older ones are smarter. If we want anything to stick we'll need real evidence. I don't want to spook them. They will eventually make mistakes. I see. She said as she absorbed his words. Just a few months ago he would have killed all of them she thought. I could go find them and snap their necks one by one. If you would prefer that. He suddenly said. It would definitely be easier. Her eyes went wide and she blurted out no. He let the silence sit for a moment looking at her with his one eye. No of course not. He finally said. He sighed and turned around looking at the clear night sky. There's a rot in our society. He started saying slowly. A cancer that is growing, that is touching every one of us. Soups, politicians, workers, citizens, all of us. He continued. It's clouding our vision and killing our minds. 
Our culture glorifies gangbangers and thugs. Our food is making us fat and lazy killing us. Our people are homeless and addicted to drugs. Our politicians pretend to listen, and our corporations pretend to care. He said with more fire and frustration in his voice. We live aimlessly, divided with no vision and direction, no dream to unite us all to push us forward to achieve what we could be. He said more wistfully. She found herself captivated by his words. All of us pretend to care. We pretend that change happens with us, the individual, that if we do a good deed a day. She felt his tone turned mocking. We would change the world for the better. But we all know that is a lie. Change comes from the top from being forced on people. He said firmly then turned to her. The local police will now investigate, maybe they will even get the feds involved all because we forced their hand. She nodded in agreement. If you want to prevent other Anayas from happening, then we have to change how things work, our schools, our police, what we value in our culture. We have to rise to the top and cut the rot from where it starts. She saw him pause and take a deep breath. She didn't dare take his eyes off him. He shook his head slightly, then looked at her again, his features softened. Come on. Enough of me ranting. I'll take you back to the tower. He once more extended his hand to her. She looked at it for a split second and took it. As their hands clasped she thought aren't you the most rotten of them all? Date? February 2023 Congratulations. Deep was the first one to break the silence. The rest followed with their own remarks to which she smiled and accepted though Meave's eyes were on the only team member that mattered. Homelander. Well I have to say that is wonderful news. He said echoing the others. My congratulations of course. To you and Elena? He asked leaving the other implied question silent. Yes. She replied. Officially as far as the public was concerned she and Elena were still together. Privately was another matter. Anonymous donor. Homelander shrugged his shoulders and gave a big one-eyed smile. Well someone out there is a very lucky man. Have you told Ashley yet? Starlight asked. No, not yet. Oh she's going to love it. The marketing department is going to have a field day with this. You're going to become number one mommy in the world. Super mommy to the rescue. Homelander said excitedly. The implication was clear there was no way to refuse the spotlight. Vought wouldn't let her and neither would Homelander. How far along are you? Annie asked with concern though Meave knew her well enough that Starlight was disappointed she wasn't told first. Six months. Oh, that's pretty far along. I thought you'd be bigger. Deep replied carelessly, and A-Train punched him. You're a moron. A-Train said shaking his head. What? What's wrong with what I said? You're wrong that's what. A-Train replied. Enough you too. Homelander butted in to stop their bickering. Meave, I think I speak for everyone when I say that we are all very happy for you. Everyone nodded in agreement. Do you know what the sex is? Starlight asked. Leave it to the only other woman in the room to ask any of the relevant questions. She thought. Yes, it's a boy. Found out last month. And have you been checked out by our doctors? Homelander asked next. No, I went to Elena's family doctor. We did the tests through their clinic. Well I insist you get checked out by ours as well. You are a part of the seven, we take care of our own and it's part of your contract. He paused and looked around the room. Part of all of our contracts. Vaught takes the health of our employees and heroes very seriously. Unless Vaught is trying to kill them of course, then screw their health. She thought. But Homelander continued, I'm sure everything is alright, and it will be a very healthy and strong boy. Now enough with the Inquisition, let's move on to today's agenda. We need a new member. We've been down to six for a while, and now more than ever with Meave's impending maternity leave. Starlight has a few ideas. He said and nodded at the blonde. Thanks Homelander. Here's what I was thinking we have a few options, as the discussion continued Meave couldn't shake the feeling that Homelander had put too much emphasis on the word strong. Date. March 2023 Dad. Ryan yelled coming down the stairs to the kitchen. Dad. He looked around at the empty kitchen. It was 7 a.m. and his dad would usually be making breakfast by now. He looked around the spacious house bewildered, he wasn't upstairs, ground floor, basement or the garage, then it clicked dot the backyard. He thought. 
He quickly rushed out the door and onto their massive deck, from where he saw Homelander floating cross-legged in front of a bunch of stacked barbell weights, looking like he was breathing heavily. Ryan thought. Dad dot 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 oh what are you doing? Homelander actually seemed startled by him as he turned to him. Ah, morning Ryan. Sorry I was concentrating so hard I actually didn't realize you were calling. That surprised Ryan since his dad seemed to always hear him, sometimes from really far away even in the city where he had trouble focusing. That's okay, but like what are you doing? Were you hurt? He asked with a bit of concern and saw Homelander immediately laugh and smile. No son, nothing like that. Nothing to worry about. He said with a smile. I was practicing a new superpower. He said with an ever bigger smile. Really? That's so cool. Ryan asked excited. He liked using his powers it made him happy and satisfied. He'd practiced really hard over the last few months to get handle on them, he was really proud of it. What is it? He asked and practically leaped to join his dad in the yard. Homelander smirked. I call it super breath. Super breath? Ryan asked confused. Yay, super breath. You know how our muscles are super strong, and we can lift really heavy weights and move really fast? Ryan nodded. Well other parts of our bodies are just as strong, fast and durable, and we just need to learn to control them. Like our lungs, diaphragm, abs muscles and a bunch of others. He said and Ryan looked confused. Here check this out. It will be easier if I show you. Homelander pointed towards a stack of 45 pounds plates that went up to Ryan's waist. He saw his dad take a much deeper breath than normal, held it for a second, and then leaned forward and blew at the stack. The pressure from the powerful breath was so strong four of the plates flew off the top into the air, landing about 20 yards away. Wow. That was amazing. Homelander smiled. Do you think I can do it too? Sure thing. Why don't you give it a shot? Ryan followed the motions his father, but his breath didn't budge any of the plates. Don't worry son. Homelander said patting his back. That took me a couple of weeks to get it right. I'm sure you'll get in no time. It's just like everything else practice practice makes perfect. I know. Ryan said cheering up. But earlier you weren't blowing the plates away and you were still breathing weird? He asked again. Ah uh, well, what I was doing is that I was trying to breath in a lot of air, his arms moved up and spread out, and keep it in my lungs condensed. His arms brought coming back together and his hands forming a ball. Effectively breathing out less air than took in. You see right now I can use super breath only for a few seconds before I run out of air, so I'm hoping to extend that time by keeping more air in my lungs. So like a reserve, like a gas tank? That's exactly right. Cool. Very cool. Homelander said mimicking his tone. Now come on. Let's go inside and get breakfast started. Are you excited for the zoo today? His dad patted him on the back and motioned for them to go inside. Definitely. Are you going to wear your disguise today? Ryan asked. Kinda have to sport. Otherwise we'll be swamped with fans. You look weird with dark hair and glasses, and your hunch makes you look so small. Well that's the idea isn't it? I'm supposed to be disguised. No one will suspect I'm the homelander. Now come on and you go. He said and opened the door. Dad. If I have super breath does that mean I can also have super spit? Ryan saw his dad almost trip as he walked in behind him. Homelander looked up at him. Ah, uh, I guess though you probably should only use that as a last resort it's kind of gross from then, I'll use it only on the really bad guys. Ryan said after a few seconds of thinking. He saw his father smile in approval. Date. March 2023 Dina watched the two women sitting across her dinner table with trepidation and curiosity. She was soon going to ascend to the top of the superhero community by joining the seven, the premier team in the world, the best of the best. Everything she had worked for since she was a little girl was almost within her grasp, fame, money, power and most of all, the ability to do good on a real scale, to really make a difference to be the symbol that every little girl looked up at. Just as she looked up at Queen Meave. So when her future teammates and women extraordinaire asked to meet her on a personal level she was ecstatic, but when they said they wanted to meet at her house in the middle of the night during the middle of the week, she knew something was wrong. Both Meave and Starlight were dressed casually looking none more glamorous or standing out more than any other New Yorker. 
That is of course if you ignored Meve's obvious baby bump. The mommy of tomorrow. The billboards called her. Women can do it all. Some of the talk show slogans said. Though she much preferred the men not required. Posters. As much as she didn't like the gaudy advertising she had to admit it was working very well. Meve baby merchandise was flying of the shelves, and there had been an uptick in same-sex couples looking into clinics and adoption options. At least according to the blogs she was reading. Either way all good things in her opinion, but from the looks of the two right now she doubted they were at her house in the middle of the night to talk about merchandising deals. So she started off you wanted to meet? I'm guessing from the circumstances this is not about having some girl talk, but about me joining team? The two nodded. Yes you see Starlight started after talking it over with me we thought it's best that we prepare you for what it means to join the seven and show you how the team works, Dina saw Starlight hesitate to continue her thought and looked briefly at Meeve, and what it means to work with, she paused Homelander. She looked at them with even more rising curiosity and some indignation. Look if this is some stupid team tradition, Hayes the new girl, so she becomes one with the team I'm not doing whatever you have planned. I already did that stupid reality show, and that was corny enough. She said with feeling more annoyed than anything. She wasn't going to let herself be bullied into some stupid tradition that was probably spawned out of the brain of some frat boy corporate schmuck. I'm a grown ass woman and I will not know. Starlight interrupted loudly and animatedly. It's not that. No hazing, no weird tradition, nothing like that. She paused. The seven aren't quite what Vought presents them to be. She started off again slowly. The team has flaws, many flaws, terrible flaws, like terrible, terrible Dina saw Meve roll her eyes and lean in interrupting Starlight. We're all terrible fucking human beings with Annie being the only remotely decent one. Homelander is the absolute worst and I'm probably third, maybe fourth. No, probably third. She said after pausing for a second. Both she and Starlight looked shocked at Meve's declaration. After processing it, Dina couldn't help but chuckle which got the attention of the other two. Come on now. All soups are fucked up. She said with a bit of relief. The powers they mess with our brains. I know I've been in a few. She said leaning in towards the two women. And if you're worried about me running my mouth don't. She paused and looked at them with intent. Trust me when I say in my time with the G-men, I've seen it all and I've done it all. I know how these things work. She said with confidence and leaned back in her seat. Not like this you haven't. Meve was quick to reply. You can read minds? How does that work? Dina looked at both of them in silence for a brief moment. I need to be within 10 feet of the person. I need to look at them and concentrate. It's ideal if we are both stationary and I can only read what the person is thinking about. It comes up as images, flashes of memory. I can only do it about 30 to 40 seconds at a time and the person will know I'm in their head. She paused for another second. Sometimes it's painful for the person sometimes it's not. Don't know why. Good then read mine. It will be easier to explain that way. Meve, are you sure? You're okay with that in your condition? She said it could be painful. Starlight interjected with concern. I am. And she looked at Dina. Do it. Curiosity taking her over Dina looked at Meve and concentrated on her. It wasn't long before thoughts, images and memories jumped up to the front of her mind. At first slow and then a torrent as she synchronized better with Meve's mind. And with each image, with each thought and each memories that she saw, that she understood and she felt a knot in her chest grow bigger, tighter, while disgust and fear crept into the depths of her mind until she broke off the connection. She shook her head for a moment as if to dispel the memories and looked back at her two teammates. You? What could she say about what she saw, about her hero? How could you? How? She started why why didn't you say something? Someone everyone, we have to say something about this. She said trying to get control of her anxious breathing. It's not right, it's too much. It's it's she was rambling she didn't know where she was going with her thought until Meve interrupted her. No. She said calmly which brought Dina back. No. She repeated back as Starlight stayed silent. Just no? That's all you have to say? She asked incredulously. Meve nodded. You will say nothing about what I've shown you and you will do nothing. Meve's tone was steel. Because, nothing was said or shown so there is nothing to be done. 
If you do, Annie and I will deny everything. We will not be on your side. If you are lucky Noir will be sent and you will die cleanly and efficiently. Dina saw Meve pause. If you are unlucky Homelander will pay you a visit and well, you've seen how that turns out. Then why show me this? Why show me this at all? Did he send you to prepare me or something? Or do you even want me on the team? She asked with nervousness and exasperation. I don't understand. No, no. Starlight intervened. Homelander does not know we are here. If he did then that wouldn't be good for any one of us. Then why the fuck are you here? Why are you showing me this? So I don't join the team? No. We want you on the team. I want you on the team. Starlight affirmed. You're exactly what the team needs. She said and paused. Look when I joined I didn't know what I was getting myself into. So I wanted to make sure you were able to make an informed decision. She said earnestly. To know that you might be in some fucked up situations and hopefully to be able to better protect yourself if you are. Protect myself? You're joking right? How can I protect myself from that madman? She asked angrily. If he says jump I have to ask how high? If he says kill I just go and crush a guy's head or it's my head? Is that the deal? Starlight leaned back and looked a bit offended. Well it's not exactly like that. She said with some reluctance. At least not in the last few months. Things have changed quite a bit, especially after he took over Vought and his fight with Soldier Boy. Changed how? Dina asked, anger lacing her tone. He's more and Starlight hesitated again looking for the right words. He's less psychotically homicidal and more worried about his legacy. Meve interrupted. They both looked at her waiting to elaborate, and Meve rolled her eyes. He thinks the moon is Gaul, and he's Caesar or Alexander the Great or something like that. He ranted about it to me one evening. He went on a big tangent about the education system, and something about a new American dream. She said, her chest deflating letting out a big sigh. Either way Annie is right, things have changed we'll see if it's for the better or not. Meve finished. Look Dina, we're not here to convince you one way or another. I think you're exactly what the team needs, but you have to understand what you're singing up for. Starlight said. Dina looked at the two women and exhaled. You'll have my answer by tomorrow. Date. March 2023 through hungry eyes, I watched the synchronized bounds of the perky soft and creamy round mounds, decorating Victoria's chest. My hands grabbed her ass and my fingers dug deep into her fleshy buttocks, bringing her closer as my mouth dove into the cream. Oh, fuck. She yelped as I slurped up her nipples with my tongue. Her fingers pushed deep into my back, nails desperately trying to break through with no avail as my strength took over, forcing her wet slippery tightness up and down, up and down on my rock-hard member at a higher rhythm than she expected. Oh, fuck. Oh dot dot fuck. Oh. Oh. Her voice higher pitched now as the pounding increased with each slap, the sound of flesh hitting flesh. As I finish suckling the last of the cream I grab her tight and hold her in place against my torso, my member deep inside of her. I feel her quiver and tremble against me as she catches her breath. I stand us up on the bed and her legs wrap around me as if afraid I'll slip out. Her weight means nothing to me. Our eyes meet and I start back the rhythmic thrusting. Her plump lips dive into mine and I share the last bit sweetness as we dance with our tongues. Her scent intoxicates me with unrelenting fire, my mouth moves to lick and suckle on her slender neck. N dot o. F. Dot dot she says between panting breaths. Hit keys. Her resistance only serves to excite me, get me harder and I pound harder than before. Slap. 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 Until the fleshy noise blends into one continuous stream. Ah. She squeals and I feel her all her muscles shudder and contract against me. Her excitement and ecstasy is infectious, and I feel myself reaching the peak as well. With one smooth motion I unbuckle and let her drop on the bed, and I shower her quivering form with my hot seed. It takes a brief moment for me to regain control of myself, and I float off to grab the box of tissue off the nightstand and offer it to her. She needs another moment to catch her breath, then she accepts my offer. You didn't get any on my hair did you? She asks and starts the cleaning process. Do you have wet whoops? No, I didn't. I respond. You can take a shower if you want. Washroom's all done. Everything up here's all done. Only first floor needs some touch-ups. She shakes her head. 
I can't. No time. I have a strategy meeting in an hour. Some DNC bigwigs are going to be joining my team. I nod and give her the wet whoops box I fished from the bottom drawer in my nightstand. When are they going to announce your nomination? I ask. And a week after the funeral. Sensitivities and all that. She confirms, her hands diligently covering all the sweet and sticky spots. I snort. At least there is still a pretense of manners in our politicians. I put on dark slacks and went downstairs to the kitchen to grab us some water and wait for her to be done. I use my x-ray vision and peek. I admit freely I felt great enjoyment watching her shimmy back into her clothes. Maybe it's just the satisfaction of a job well done, or just the jiggliness of the flesh brought joy to me. It takes her a few minutes and a washroom break before she makes her way downstairs all proper and prim, her scent being the only clue of our midday activity. I hand the cup of water and she downs half of it. She puts the cup down and looks up, our eyes meet, golden brown and sky blue. We hold the silent connection for a whole moment, and then she speaks. You know we won't be able to meet up like this? I know. I confirm. The scrutiny will be too intense. She nods. Even today, I really shouldn't have come. You had official business. I say and she really did, though not really necessary for the director of the FBSA to come in person but close enough. Silver Kincaid joining the team, Starlight's training program, new hero standards with FBSA buy-in and all that. Which my successor will actually see implemented. She responded with HMPH nonetheless you'll still get the credit for it. I say with a smirk. I know. She says as a gentle smile touches her lips. All business from now on. She says after a second. All business. I confirm and we move to the elevator. We hold the silence as the doors open with a ding. She enters, presses the button and turns to me our eyes meet again, but neither of you say anything. 1.2.3 time passes slowly, an eternity. Our eyes don't dare to break from their embrace, and as the doors finally close I hear a faint whisper. Goodbye John. I stare on blinking at the closed doors with their cold metallic sheen, and whisper goodbye Victoria. Cameron. Welcome to 7 on 7 this morning for a special edition of our show. Today officially marks a new era in mankind's space exploration, as our beloved superhero Homelander officially enters the race by performing the official test flight of Thevlite's V1 capsule. Now I'm not expert in any matters related to space, so joining me today to remark on this tremendous moment is retired astronaut, engineer, fighter pilot and musician Chris Hadfield. Welcome to the show Christ. Chris. Thank you Cameron. Glad to be here. Cameron. Now Chris you have been given access to the V1 capsule and behind the scenes at V-Lite. What can you tell us about it? Chris. Well Cameron, it is essentially a capsule that is 9 meters in diameter and 18 meters in height. It has a volume of aprox. 1000 cubic meters of cargo space, and it weighs about 4 metric tons. Cameron. And how much weight can this capsule hold? Chris. That is an interesting question. The payload of the capsule, that is the term we use for the cargo carrying capacity of space rockets, is technically up to 100 tons. Now of course I'm not sure if the term really applies here, since Homelander is replacing the role of the rocket. So maybe it's better to refer to it as the weight that the capsule can support in case of emergency descent. Cameron. Emergency descent, what do you mean by that? Can you elaborate? Chris. Since Homelander is doing the lifting it all depends on how much weight he can fly into orbit. In test flights I've seen him move up to 30 tons quite easily. So our instinct is to say that payload is 30 tons. However the capsule itself can always be reinforced to hold more weight, as long as Homelander can fly it up, and the special harness that attaches Homelander to the capsule holds. But what if the harness snaps, or there is some sort of unknown accident, and he loses control of it and drops it? So the engineers ask themselves what is the highest weight that they can safely use parachutes on for an emergency descent? The current design and materials allow for a safe descent for up to 100 tons. So even if Homelander could lift 200 tons, they would never load the capsule to that weight, with the current harness and emergency descent system. Cameron. Wow, thank you for making that distinction for myself and our viewers at home. And today's test flight there is no cargo in the capsule is that right? Chris? That is correct. 
This flight will be all about getting capsule into low Earth orbit about 510 km altitude, testing the various systems and the launch mechanism for the satellites as well of course the descent and emergency systems. Cameron? And Chris with Homelander doing heavy lifting there has been talk in the media that Homelander will be distorting the space flight market and that it will be unfair competition. What can you tell us about that? Chris? In a way they are right, but they are also wrong. You see problem with putting things into space is the exorbitant cost to lift things up there. With Homelander there is no cost so from a purely business point of view, I can see what they mean. However from the point of view of mankind as a whole, this is exactly what we need to kick things into high gear. With Homelander's help we can expand the space station maybe even start a colony on the moon. He can lift things piecemeal and we can assemble them in orbit. We can bring machines to the moon and start manufacturing spacecraft there. The possibilities are endless. Cameron. A moon colony. Wow just wow. This is really the next great step isn't it? Chris. It sure is Cameron. I hope I can see it in my lifetime. Cameron. Now I want to bring it back to the money side of things again, since we've gotten a lot of questions about it ever since Vought announced V-Lite. And even in our Congress, there has been contention from both sides of the aisle about fair competition and getting the approvals and Chris. Cameron. I'm Canadian so I don't think it's fair for me to discuss the politics involved, nor am I an economics expert. What I can tell you though is that up to a decade ago almost all manned space flights were government funded and any commercial flights were usually unmanned and cargo carrying only. Essentially launching satellites in space. Cameron. Okay. Chris. And even the companies launching satellites did it only because they thought they could get a great return from it, so we are talking about big corporations here. As both launch technology and telecommunications technology improved, we started to see more smaller secondary players enter the market. Cameron. You mean companies like SpaceX and Blue Origin? Chris. Exactly. They brought new ideas and new ways of doing things. And these companies are slowly moving into manned space flights for commercial purposes. And they are doing this because they see a market for it, a way to make money. And the more infrastructure we can get into space the easier it becomes to be there, more people will be interested into going there. That will spur more investment for companies like SpaceX and Blue Origin, that means more technological advancements making things cheaper, which in turn will create even more interest so on and so forth. Cameron. So it's the rising tide that will lift all boats well in this case rockets. Chris. Haha, <laughs> well put. Even more so companies should not be worried about competing with Homelander, they should be looking at the opportunities Homelander will provide. If anything they should be worried that Homelander will not able to do as much as we want him to. Cameron. Oh, what do you mean by that Chris? Chris. Well superpowers or not, he is still just one man, and there are only 24 hours in a day. He's chairman of Vought, leader of the seven the world's greatest superhero, he's flying around helping people left right and center, he's doing talk shows, movies, promoting science education and so many other things. We are honestly lucky that he has the time to start this venture. I cannot stress enough how much this is going to help humanity if we can just create even the basic orbital infrastructure. Cameron? You know Chris, I never even thought of it that way. Being in New York and working for Vought I think that sometimes I just take Homelander for granted. He's really the gift that keeps on giving. Chris, I've just received word from our producers that V-Lite was just given the go-ahead and they will launch in 5 minutes. So we are going to switch to the live view for Homelander's takeoff. I hope you can walk us through the different stages of the flight. But before that a quick break. Date. May 2023 Homelander's Journal May. 13th 2023 I thought it fitting that I start my journal on the day that my greatest enemy, so far, is buried dead into the ground. William Butcher is no more. Finally. I watched him over the months deteriorate more and more becoming only a husk of his former self. I thought for sure he would drop dead or at least go into a coma over a month ago, but it seems out of sheer stubbornness he refused to let go. I can only assume he wanted to see the birth of his child. Ha. Huh. I get much more joy at that thought than I should be. Truthfully I had nothing against a man it was only because of our intertwined pasts that meant him and I could never reconcile. 
Besides superpowers or not, I simply couldn't have a resourceful hateful cunt like him alive to keep gunning for me. I was only ever so lucky that he went against his principles and became what he hated the most. It killed him and removed that annoyance of a substitute little brother off the board, and I didn't even have to lift a finger. I was worried he would release the video as a last fuck you, but it seems he didn't and I don't think he will. I don't know if Frenchie, MM or Mallory have it my best guess he entrusted everything to Meave to have as a last effort deterrent against me. She's probably the one that convinced him not to do it. I doubt she'd want to raise her son in a post-apocalyptic world. Not that I would ever let it get to that point. It's amazing what you can do with deep fakes nowadays. There's a whole website where people make deep fakes of celebrities fucking. Some are so good I wonder if they aren't actually real sex tapes. No, nothing to worry on that front, I'm prepared if that video ever surfaces. Meave is due soon and so should Kamiko. The Vought doctors say everything is normal with Meave's pregnancy, no signs of powers or abnormalities yet, but I know better, and I think Meave feels it too. Literally I've seen that boy's kick. Still it remains to be seen how he will develop, even my gifts only fully surfaced after a few years. Ryan's were even longer, but that may be because of the sterilized environment he was raised in. As for Kamiko I have no idea how her pregnancy is progressing. Her and Frenchie had basically disappeared doing god knows what nonsense only appearing for Butcher's funeral. All I got from observing her was that the baby was also a boy, already sporting a flush of dark hair, in contrast to Meave's kid sporting red. It seems the trend is for all the boys to take after their mothers typical. Though as Ryan is maturing every day I see more and more of his grandfather and him soldier boy. One day I have to take a trip to the moon and tie up that loose end as soon as I figure out what to do with him I very much doubt that he's fully dead. I can't simply assume that not when I feel no adverse effects when in space outside my need to breath which I'm slowly working on. I still need a suite to be in space, but because of my innate hardiness, my spacesuit is maximized for optimal mobility and breathing time. It's quite sleek and unlike those bulky tanks that regular humans have to wear. The V-Lite launch was successful, and in a few months we will launch our first cadre of satellites. Byron Sad is ramping up production and software programming. Things are going to start moving very fast soon. I need V-Lite to be a success within two years. With it as a success story and hopefully Singer and Victoria in office, I'll be able to rope in the government. Then things will really pick up first orbit then the moon. Still soldier boy, soldier boy, soldier boy. What am I to do with you? Maybe I can chuck him into the sun. Date. June 2023 The Earth, a shining blue pearl in a sea of darkness, a breathtaking image, I don't think I will ever be tired of seeing. The ocean's blue feeding this otherwise unassuming rock with life-giving water, the continents with their vast grassy plains, transforming into protruding mountains where frozen snow colored the tops white, the green forests dotting the lands, evoking a fresh feel, the rivers that snake through in every direction, and even the light-up gray concrete spots where mankind gathered all moved. Shifted and connected gently forming a cacophony of lights and colors to my eye, as if part of a greater magical whole. There was a sense of admiration and amazement of this living, breathing planet of ours, coupled with a sense of sadness and dread, when thinking that the whole human race and sapient life in our known universe was here and only here. And it was all mine. All mine for the taking. All mine to shape, mold and change in my image. I was burdened with glorious purpose to lead mankind, conquer the star themselves and usher in a new golden age. But first I needed to make sure V-Lite was a success, which is why I was floating more than 600 kilometers over the Earth in low orbit. Homelander you've reached correct orbit parameters. Capsule is ready to deploy cargo. Spoke the radio in my helmet. I quickly double-checked the display in my helmet to make sure it was all right. Roger that, maintaining orbit. I answered back. Undergoing pre-deployment checks. Ground control answered. And all clear. Cargo ready to deploy in 3, 2, 1. I watched in silence as the satellites deployed one by one, unfurling their panels and jettisoning into correct orbital positions. 60 Byron 3, often referred to as B3, satellites were being deployed in this first launch. 
The B3 satellite model was not the most up-to-date technology available being already half a decade old however, most of the operational kinks had been worked out, and it had become the workhorse telecommunication satellite of Byron Satcom. Additionally the materials, parts and chips to manufacture the satellites, were more readily available on the market than newer more competitive models. In summary it was a tried and true tested technology that we were able to manufacture easily enough. If all goes well then in a month we will be able to double production capacity, and then double it again in the next month. By the end of the year we'll have an array of over 1300 satellites, and triple that by the end of the second year. If things go really well then in a year we'll be able to launch the first proprietary V-Lite satellite, which is really just going to be an upgraded version of the Bryron 6 satellite. Once the engineering teams realized they don't need to worry about weight anymore, they kind of went well crazy. The requirements were still being finalized, so I wasn't putting too much hope in it. I knew the more capabilities were integrated the more complex the design had to be, and the more time it took to troubleshoot everything. So for now the B3 will have to do. Deployment complete. Homelander confirm visual? I know the cameras transmitting to ground control already confirmed visual, but since this is the first mission I use my supervision to check the capsule and scan the satellites, as they all were moving into orbital positions. Confirmed. I can't see anything wrong with the cargo. Glad to hear that. All our instruments confirm cargo is in working condition. You are clear for descent. Roger that. Beginning descent. I confirm and begin my practice descent at a leisurely 500 clicks an hour. I was rushing V-Lite internet to market not only to beat the competition, but also because I needed to look successful. When you are operating at my level appearances were everything, and I needed to be seen as more than just the celebrity boy scout hero, the strongest man in the world, the number one hero, the savior of New York. I wanted to build a different kind of trust with America. I wanted them to see me as someone that can lead, that can enact change that can get things done. I wanted to create a different kind of mythos around me one of intelligence, capability and business sense. I would soon come to lean on that rust and reputation probably more than anything else. I was going to ask a lot of America in the next two decades, specifically a lot of money and power. You don't start a whole new space race with just the wallet and influence of one company. No, no, no. You need massive government support, the backing of a whole nation. Billions and billions will be needed for R&D alone to have better well everything for colonizing space. Of course the fact that all of this new spending will make me one of the richest man in the solar systems is only an added benefit. All of that was in the long term and the short term it also looked incredibly good for the street. Even though we were on the road to recovery after the stock took a nosedive from the initial announcement last year, spending forecasted spending was increasing, and we would have a pretty turbulent second half of the year. New training and retraining for the heroes, wage increases all across the board, better benefits and health insurance, more training for managers and frontline staff, the ever-expanding R&D did not come cheap. Hell our new maternity policy was going to cost tens of millions. Vought was now the leader in maternity benefits in the country. Amazing for employees, fantastic for my and Vought's reputation, but terrible for keeping costs down. Keeping the stock price up was integral not only to ensure I kept my position as chairman of the board, but also because a large part of my wealth was a tied to Vought stock, and most of my space investments won't really pay off for another five years, assuming everything goes well. Which it never does. But nevertheless I was willing to risk all the extra spending at the worst case scenario I would have bought the hearts, minds and loyalties of at least 200,000 Americans. Besides I always figured that LexCorp must have had kickass benefits too otherwise, why would people continue to work there? Date. June 2023 he took a slow breath to calm himself and another look at his target. With the path clear and no interference in sight he moved. With confident steps he put up an air of control even though excitement filled his chest. As he closed in, seeing his target unaware, he cleared his throat. Excuse me sir. He said with relief that his voice didn't crack. His target turned around plate full and shrimp in hand. You're Nubian Prince right dot 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 I mean of course you are. He started stuttering emotions getting the better of him for asking such an obvious question. I just wanted to say how much of an inspiration you are. 
I've been following your work since you started in Detroit, you're the reason I wanted to become a hero in the first place, he stopped as he noticed his hero look at him not and swallowed his food. Nubian Prince put his plate down and wiped his hands with a napkin. Nice to meet you kid. What's your name? Instantly he felt relief as he took the taller dark-skinned man's hand in his own and shook it. Darren Delohouse sir he saw Nubian Prince raise his eyebrow at him. Uh, I mean side strike sir. Nubian Prince smiled at him. Nice to meet you Darren. Just remember when in costume it's always your hero name, it's company policy. He said gently. Yes sir Nubian Prince sir? Just call me Gerald while we are here. And enough with the sir stuff, we're both heroes here. Plus you are making me feel like my father. Uh, yay of course, sure thing Gerald. Side strike said. You're pretty new right kid? How many years in the business? Gerald asked. Just started last year well I mean I went thought the academy and graduated last year. And how are you finding it so far? He hesitated to answer, but felt he should say the truth to the person he admired the most. Uh, honestly it is not what I expected. He hesitated. In what way? Nubian Prince asked in earnest interest. Well, he started. Once I graduated I thought I'd be out there in the field doing good, you know, catching bad guys and helping people. But it's been a lot less field work than I thought and a lot more media focus, I guess he paused briefly, like they are having me do a lot of TikTok videos every time I go out. They say it's for community outreach, but I think it's mostly because I gained a big following during my academy days. He saw Nubian Prince smile and chuckle. It's just part of the job Darren. Trust me you'll get your time in the field, you'll get your hands dirty, and if you stick long enough you'll get to see stuff you wish you hadn't seen. Every hero here has a few cases they wish they hadn't seen, gruesome stuff. He saw Gerald tone turn summer, as if remembering memories he wish he didn't have. You'll get to help people personally, and that's important don't get me wrong, but the media stuff, the movies, the commercials the sponsorships the TikToks that important as well. Darren listened intently. That's how the company makes money and that's how we make money. And make no mistake money is how you change the world. You see I've been in this business for a decade and a half. Saved a lot of people and lost quite a few. You never get to save everyone you have to remember that kid. Gerald said as a matter of fact. But you know what I'm most proud of? Darren didn't smartly didn't answer the rhetorical question. It's the Maya Center for Excellence. Darren looked confused for a moment trying to figure out where he heard that name before. It's the private school academies I've founded. Nubian Prince supplied helpfully. Five schools about three to four hundred students each half the seats go to low-income inner city kids. Every year over 200 students graduate and go to college on scholarships that would have never had the opportunity otherwise. Almost all the kids graduate college and make six figures within five years. He continued proudly. We have a 60% year-over-year alumni donation rate. People giving back to help other students. We've created a community that improves people lives more, and none of it could have been possible without my money, fame and influence as Nubian Prince. He finished off with a satisfied smile. Darren took a moment to absorb his words. I see. I never really thought of it that way. He finally said, feeling a bit ashamed. Don't worry kid you're young, you're just starting out. Just remember if you want to change the game you first have to play it. Take for example he said and looked around the room until he found his target. Starlight. He pointed Darren at the captain of the seven, talking with a group and eating snacks. How many people do you think she saved in the past few months? Maybe a dozen maybe two, maybe less. But how many people do you think the Home Light Foundation helped? Hundreds. He said and looked back at Darren. So you have to decide for yourself how you want to help the world. You can do the time and take the money to make a difference, or you can buy fancy cars and bling for yourself. Nubian Prince paused and looked at him intensely, then turned back to the table and picked up his plate. It's all up to you Darren. I understand. I have a lot to think about. No worries kid. Now come on lunch is almost done make sure you eat up. He said loading up his place with shrimp. We're spending the rest of the afternoon on de-escalation techniques. We'll be running through quite a few scenarios. Make sure you pay attention and do your best. Had a chat with the big man himself he's making it a sticking point to reduce the number of lawsuits. Yay sure thing. 
Darren said and started to load a plate of fried rice and lemon chicken for himself. As he was putting the much needed sustenance a thought just struck him. He'd been so into the conversation that he didn't really notice until now, he felt compelled to ask. Uh, Gerald, I hope it's not rude of me to ask, but he didn't get to finish as Nubian Prince answered. I was born in Detroit. Parents from Sudan so I know the accent. I put it on for the cameras. He said with a small smirk. It's all part of the show kid. He finished with a wink and left to talk to another group of heroes. And that concludes this episode. If you enjoyed it, I'd seriously love it if you guys could leave a like on the video as it genuinely helps out so much, and it keeps me going, plus it takes only one second. That said, have a wonderful day. See you in the next one.